Welcome to our workshop today on building a case for democratising your leadership development. Uh, my name's Christine Carey. I work for the Leadership Pipeline Institute here in the UK. Uh, and here with me is my colleague, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Marion. Yes, hi, I'm uh, Marion Gravel, a recovering Chief People Officer. The counselling is going well. Uh, and I work alongside Christine in the UK and Ireland practice of Leadership Pipeline Institute and uh, delighted to be with you here today. Thanks, Marion. So what do we do here at the Leadership Pipeline Institute? Well, we do two things and we do two things really well. Number one is that we help you map your leadership and specialist roles and levels and um, creating a portrait. And then number two is we provide excellent transition training and coaching to help support leaders and specialists be successful at every level in every role. And as you can see, we do this globally over 20 countries and languages and already have worked with over 40,000 uh, people across the globe. And we've been basing our impact on, on research across two areas. Uh, initially, our foundational research, um, which happened around 20 years ago. Secondly, and crucially, we've been applying that research over the last 20 years in terms of everyday leadership and specialist experience. And often we start a conversation with clients by asking three key questions. So I'm going to suggest that you pause the video now and have uh, reflect on those three questions to see to what extent you believe you can define what leadership is, what are the barriers to leadership, and what are we doing today within companies as and also as an industry? Well, welcome back uh, to this um, presentation, and I hope you had some quality me time. Uh, certainly I did. So the answer to question one from our applied and foundational research is that leadership adds value in a completely unique way at every single role. So the role of leading others adds value in a completely different and unique way to the way that leaders of leaders adds value. Similarly, Leading a function adds value in a completely unique, different way. So each leadership role is different and it starts with transparency. The transparency of the leadership job that needs to get done at each unique level. So question two, what are the typical barriers? to transition from one level to the next. So as an example, here's the transition barriers that we often see, most often see, at the crucial leader of leaders level. That role that is the squeezed middle, the most misunderstood and crucial role in many organisations. So reflection time. Please take a few moments by pausing the video and to see to what extent you've seen leaders of leaders fail to effectively develop their own direct reports as leaders. Hold them accountable for technical work rather than the leadership job that needs to get done. Head across those layers and roles and go straight to individual contributors and fail to see the real value in the value chain. Please take a few moments to see whether you've seen any of those in the organisations you spend time with. Welcome back once again. So what are we doing today? What are companies, organisations, what is our industry doing in terms of unblocking those barriers, really getting effective value add leadership? We're spending an enormous amount of time on skills and skills development. We're doing our very best to select the right leaders in the right way for the role 
that they need to deploy. We have career structures. Depending on the size of the organization, you may well have top 100, top 200 executive programs. And we do love a bit of hypo. Those crucial identified individuals that have got that something special that we would invest in more than others to get that biggest return on investment. And strategy. We're always trying to do something, making a link between strategy and leadership, leadership and strategy. What our research suggests, though, is that is not enough. Skills is sufficient, but not enough. Is it really efficient? Is it really sufficient? No. What is more important than skills is how we spend our time. What is even more important than time is how we believe we add value. So only when we as leaders have made the transition, changed our mindsets into how we uniquely add value, how do we believe we add value, only then will we use and deploy time differently, and only then will we deploy and refine our skills accordingly. When we know what the leadership job that needs to be done is at each unique level, then that transparency makes selection far more fact-based and observable. All of those elements of transition and transparency really brings our structures to life. Finally, all our leaders need to be developed all of the time. It is not to replace high potentials, but it is to supplement it. So how do you make your organisation a talent factory? How do you get a culture of leadership-led development? How can all our leaders be developed all of the time? And on the crucial question of strategy, strategy without execution is just a bunch of good ideas. And there's lots of good ideas out there. How do you explicitly make it clear which roles in leadership are driven to design, translate, and crucially execute strategy and hold other leaders accountable for strategy execution. So those are the key elements from our 20 years worth of applied research based on our foundation, foundational research ahead of that. Christine. Thanks, Miriam. Thank you. So I'm going to follow in a very similar and familiar way as Marion just has to talk about your specialists. And once again, we'll start with these first three questions. What is a specialist to you? What are the barriers to successfully managing the specialists? And what do you already do today to manage your specialists? Take a few minutes, reflect, and we'll see you back here in a moment. Welcome back. Hope you're enjoying this repeated me time that we keep giving you. So again, very similar to what you'll have seen with Marion. You'll see a theme coming here um, from our foundational and complementary architecture that you can see there. Just a different colour to what you saw before. We have also found from our research that there are different layers and jobs to get done and outputs at different roles for specialists. And we call those a knowledge expert, a knowledge leader and a knowledge principal. Once again, what value do they add at each unique layer? Thank you, Marion. To go a little bit more in depth with a specialist, with the leadership, it's very clear. Each leadership role is defined on who or what they are leading. With a specialist, it's slightly more in depth. So we're looking at knowledge. They manage knowledge how much knowledge they have in their depth, but also their breadth of knowledge as well, which I'll dive into a little bit more in a few moments. 
We're looking at how what level of results orientation they are responsible for. Is it operational? Is it strategic? We're looking at what kind of communication they are responsible for. Is it within their teams? Do they have a broader breadth of influence across the organization? And finally, what level of innovation are they responsible for? Do they have to work with continuous improvement or are they moving up to strategic innovation, looking externally, perhaps even to invention at that level? Thank you. And then again, that second question, what barriers do you see in being able to successfully manage your population of specialists? And again, we've taken one example layer here of the knowledge leader with five typical transition issues that we have found through our research around how they keep the customer in mind, how they manage stakeholders and work across the value chain, uh, whether they are recognized within the organization for their own area of expertise and how they contribute to the development of that domain of expertise within the organization. So again, take a few moments, see if any of these seem familiar within your population of specialists in your organization. Welcome back again. So again, we'll go to this third and final question about what you currently do today. And what we typically see with the clients that we work with, and it's a much smaller list this time, and it's a smaller list because specialists are not thought of in the same way as leadership, which brings us to our whole presentation and workshop today. So three key things that we see clients typically do uh, within their organisations is they spend a lot of time and focus making sure that specialists can develop their depth of knowledge, which makes perfect sense. And let's put a couple of examples to this. We may be talking IT professionals, engineering professionals. So it makes sense that they spend that time and focus on that depth of knowledge. Also, we need to make sure they have some kind of title structure so that they know who they are and people know who to go to within the organization with regarding that specialism or domain. And of course, they are part of the strategy, uh, moving towards a strategy, included within a strategy. Again, maybe this is just a word that's kind of put around without too much thought going into it. So let's see again from our research, is that enough? Well, of course it's not. Um, and you can probably see very, very similar um, areas that Marion just talked about with leaders. So once again, if I work from the bottom of this top box, it's not enough just for them to develop their skills. They also need to develop how they are applying their time successfully and that shift in work value so that they really understand how they add value at each unique layer within their specialism. Now. I said I would talk a little bit more about the depth and breadth of knowledge. Now, the depth of knowledge, how much they know, the breadth of knowledge, how much it impacts the organisation. What scope is there with regards to their knowledge area, their domain of expertise? Um, again, with that communication part and the influence. Now, here we're really talking about they need to influence without direct control of directly leading people. How successful are they within that? Uh, one thing that we see that doesn't come up a lot as a focus with our clients is the selection process. It's kind of a given that they know how to select for their individual uh, specialisms, but not selecting around being really transparent and selecting around this depth and breadth of knowledge, results orientation, who they need to communicate and influence with, et cetera. And of course, that transparency then helps uh, create a, a solid career path and understanding the influence within that career path and structure, not just a job title. Again, it's this leader led development. We're not just focusing on high potentials or people leaders, but we're actually making sure that all leaders are led, uh, are developed all of the time because a company's culture is only as good as your weakest link. So all leaders need to be developed all of the time. And as Marion so rightly said, 
an, an, a strategy without an execution is just an idea. So how are we holding our specialists accountable and who do they need to hold accountable? Again, having that influence without direct control and how involved in the strategy are we getting them in? Thank you, Marion. Thanks, Christine. Really great summary there of our work. When you bring both elements together of leadership and specialist architecture, unsurprisingly, there are similar themes. Skills are not enough. Our much honed and invested in competency models have their place, but we need to go way beyond skills into a change in how we view time and how we apply time and how we value what we do as leaders and specialists, leaders of people and leaders of domains of expertise. That transparency needs to flow through into how we select in to an organisation and also how we select in and up within an organisation. All of that then drives a real world structure, a real world organisation, which gives career and influence and impact across the piece. All of which requires a democratisation of development. How can every leader, how can every specialist be developed all of the time so that the investment is democratised across the piece to get the biggest return on investment. And finally, the design, translation and execution of strategy, again, needs to be democratised across all leaders and all specialists. So we bring all of that together in our foundational and complementary architecture. When you zip up both leadership and specialist development, a more cohesive foundational and complementary architecture can then be embedded into organisation and leveraged to develop the best amount of value. We hope that introduction has been of some value to you. Um, obviously, very happy to chat through any questions you've got uh, and any further insight that you would like to glean from us. Um, and uh, you can contact us um, uh, offline. I'll be very happy to chat through with that. Um, but for, for the moment, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, an au revoir from Christine and I. And um, hopefully uh, you'll have a very good day. Thank you very much, everyone.